So we um, have an opportunity to have a conversation specifically about uh, this talk, but this is also now an opportunity to begin to broaden uh, and engage uh, the panel as a whole and uh, in short order, relatively short order to enga engage the audience. And I I'm going to just uh, use sort of moderate moderator's prerogative to maybe address your talk, uh, Liz, but in a way that might also begin to draw in David uh, and, and Jimmy and, uh, and your holiness. Um, one thing that has just struck me now as, as you were speaking in a connection that I hadn't quite uh, sort of seen before uh, was when you were speaking about the important role that having a purpose, mm -hmm. uh, for old, giving older people a purpose um, uh, has on, on their health and cognitive ability and, and so on. And it, it just occurs to me that there's a, there's a kind of a common theme across all of these talks here that we thought that getting, staying healthy or getting healthy is something that we do for ourselves, but it almost seems as if uh, it's a side effect of doing things for others. That it becomes something that happens to us while we're in the bu busy serving others or engaged in some, uh, some purposeful life activity. And I wonder, <laughs> this isn't my data, this is a... <laughs> Uh, I, I wonder whether or not there might not be a really interesting thing to just throw out. It seemed to me, Jimmy, when... Because of this then, if, I mean, if this is true, then the ways we begin to think about improving health begin to connect to issues of ethics and service. Hmm? It becomes a much bigger conversation uh, than we might have even have even thought. Uh, in in your presentation, Jimmy, you had your distress scale, and there was a very important part of the distress distress scale that had to do with the meaning. You know, whether right. people feel that their, their life is meaningful, and and obviously, David, you know, in in yours, the you know, it's all when people come together, the women come to these support groups for themselves, but they come at least as much because they care about the others. And we just talked about yours. So I wonder if, uh, first your holiness, whether you might have any thoughts about this and then we can maybe open this up to everyone here. Hmm. Well, that's my fundamental belief. <laughs> belief is all that, huh? View, long. Uh, fundamental view. Taking care about others, helping others, out of sense of concern of others' well-being. The reward, the reward to oneself is immense. Oh. I just wondering, uh, many years, I think maybe 10, 10 years ago, maybe one time in Sweden, one person, you see, he, I think, started one sort of movement, perhaps I think, movement. The retired old people. You see, should carry some work carrying children. Mm -hmm. So both sides is a benefit. Yes. The older people, uh, even myself, you see, when I'm mixing with young students and talk with them, at that moment I also feel I'm younger. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> then they among old people, then something like So when you mix only with the old people, then it almost feels like we're asking each other a question of who is going to go first? <laughs> <laughs> so then children's side. I think sometimes, even I think uh, there are the cases, there are sort of, I think obviously so there's such happen. The, the grand, sort of grandparent, sometimes you see, even sort of more closer, yes. they are grand, they are grandchildren. No. The parent, obviously, this is some work in here and there. Those retired, mm -hmm. sort of uh, men and women, you see, can spend more time with children and play. Mm -hmm. you know. So they themselves you see, feel something active, life. Uh, and something useful, and also uh, passing time very easily. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
And the children also, you see, get, I think, more, sometimes you say maximum, per se, they, uh, 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 I think, affection. And then, you see, unlike, you see, there's some sort of, or say, the institution who taking care of children, then person who look after them uh, as a sort of, on, on the basis of salary, and sometimes this new person come. But then children, a new person as a stranger. But the person who several years was with them, and then the person has got the bond. A bond. bond. They create a bond. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is some organization who take care about mm -hmm. children. They found the consulta chick, kudukudu bed, ugo chick. Solonis is referring to um, some organization that have worked in South America. No, no, no. Sweden. 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 Um, Sweden, where um, one of the things that they have figured out was that uh, in the caring of children, uh, one important fact is to ensure that the caregivers are not constantly changed. Oh, oh this is not, not, not Sweden. Yes. Now, this idea you see from one, one American Sweden. lady. Yeah. The South America lady. Uh, uh, actually, it was um, the, what I was the, the thinking of. Um, it's, it, it's an American. <laughs> Um, it is an American organization that has worked uh, in orphanages in South America. Oh, and one thing that they found out that was very important was the most important, one of the important factors was to ensure that the caregivers have enough time to create a bond with yes. the child uh, so that the caregivers are not constantly changed. And the caregivers so, benefit. So at that time, mm -hmm. I actually asked one Tibetan in Sweden Please keep close contact with that organization. And that movement you see, can start in India, Tibetan community. Those old people, although you see, they spend whole day on money, pay me, on money, pay me. <laughs> no, that also good. But you see, meantime, they can some kind of active role. <laughs> oh, much sort of combine that, uh, thinking next life. And meantime, the remaining sort of life, some sort of Active useful, sort of meaningful life. But then, the Shanghai Kagan was a dish. So he hasn't heard anything back from mm -hmm. that person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now, so your research, you see, these things now make, sort of, make, make, known. make known. And not only just to sort of prosody, uh, carry research and uh, uh, publish one sort of article, not sufficient. We should sort of, Dis they, disseminate uh, it. Movement in the cool one. We actually need kind of movements to bring it out there. I think also that the uh, participants often don't recognize the benefit until they get into the situation and realize. So, for example, with that experience core experience, mm. some of the volunteers keep coming back mm. because when they arrive back at the school, the children run up and say, you're here again, you're here again, I've been waiting oh, yes. for you yes, to yes, come. Yes, and that enriches their whole experience. Yeah, so, yeah. so convincing yeah. people of that is very important. Yeah. Because of loneliness, stress, I do Yeah, loneliness was there. So, loneliness was, uh, you know, you had a, uh, an image. You a know, picture, um, actually, one picture. Uh, when you were talking about loneliness, there was an image of an elderly gentleman, but his loneliness was. So, you mentioned, you see, shorter life. Shorter life. Mm? But, it's, it's but the picture, a very old person. <laughs> 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 immediately felt there was an irony there. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, did you want to say something? Well, I've gotten very interested in older people, for, you know, only, only an intellectual reason, of course. <laughs> Nothing to do with my own age. However, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in working with groups with years. older people, this issue of finding a reason to be connected and 
enthusiastic about something, either it's reading a book or it's talking with one another, it's helping somebody. But if I can help them to find something to connect to that makes life meaningful, worthwhile, purposeful, all those things over interact, I think, and overlap. But they all lead to trying to make the most of what life one has left, whatever that is. I think one of the implications of this discussion is that consciousness is contagious. And so the example you gave of an older person being with a younger person, we change, we're different. We find different feelings within ourselves when we're interacting with a child than we do with an adult. And so it gets me to the question of to the extent to which we think of ourselves as just splendid individuals, or is the human condition fundamentally one of connection? And is the problem that as people get sick, certainly in our culture, they lose their connection. And so I, I've noticed that in the Buddhist tradition, part of, part of meditation is not simply turning inward, but uh, loving kindness and compassion. And I wonder if you could comment on the importance of the social aspect of, of mindfulness. Hmm? That, uh, I always this is stress oneness of hu entire humanity. Uh, that I feel very, very important. Uh, not necessarily believer or non-believer. Uh, so actually we are one of the, one of the human beings, each of us, one of the human beings of the seven billion family. No? Uh, that's a big human family. So if we uh, remain on that level, then, so no barrier. We can easily, as a day, communicate, uh, develop some closeness feeling. Uh, then, ready to share. Uh, their sort of happiness is my happiness. Their suffering is my suffering. That kind of sort of concept easily can develop. When we too much emphasis on the level of differences, secondary, secondary level, then different nation, nationality, different color, different sort of faith, or like that. And within there, rich and poor, and educated, uneducated, and a healthy body, body, unhealthy body, and lots of the differences. Huh? So these additional sort of the barrier. I always tell you when I give talk, say, when I give talk, I sort of have the feeling, oh, I'm talking another human being. If, you say, I sort of keep some kind of feeling, I'm Tibet, I'm Eastern, Eastern, I'm Asian, I'm Tibetan, I'm Buddhist, then immediately you see create some kind of barrier. Then a little bit sort of feeling of distance. That brings sometimes uneasiness or nervous also, sometimes. And then also the pretend, uh, pretense, uh, pretense, uh, pretense also come. Of course, one time, we should to do, of course, we should to do, we always teach, teasing each other, you see. <laughs> Very nice person. So you see, sometimes he, uh, of course, he's teasing, not sort of seriously, so talking. You see, teasing me, or oh, you are a Buddhist leader, you should act like more holy. <laughs> so, and at the same time, he often described me as a mischievous person. <laughs> like that. So in any way, you see, sometimes you see religion, uh, if you too much emphasis on the sort of religious differences, then some sort of inconvenient, some uncomfortable feeling when you talk with other sort of a believer like that. Forget these things. And basic level, we are the same human being. They want happy life. I want happy life. Emotionally, mentally, physically, we are the same. Mm -hmm. On that level, look. So, uh, I think the our attitude was. That, is, attitude. Uh, that also, you see, we have to cultivate that kind of attitude from childhood. I think children, child, say, not much concern about differences. 
so long, played together, smiled together, and they feel very happy. They never count. They calculate. Oh, calculate their sort of uh, social sort of background or all these things. <coughs> so we must sort of uh, keep using that kind of sort of spirit. open spirit. So sometimes we, uh, I think we can learn many things from children. Yeah. They're very honest. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, え、ね、しゃべらないで、ルキョラメトドは。アムラ。え、ポクテナチェ。え、ね。で、にしゃべんとみで、ね、コムコムとのがよって、アスルで。え、ポクテトアステ。カンドスネケジェ、しゃべん
much easier when actual death come. Those people, then it's those people who avoid even the word of death, avoid. Then sooner or later death come, then unexpectedly, so that. They're, they're taking it back. Oh. Then, of course, uh, as a practitioner, in my daily practice, the visualization, death process, then intimate state, then as a rebirth. So Kishila also, Kala also knows that. I think you also used to practice that, isn't it? Your daily sort of practice, or like that. So in my case, different sort of uh, mandalas, at, I think at least uh, five, six. So each day during my sort of, uh, meditation, this is six times death and intimate state and rebirth. rebirth. So suppose uh, preparing, actual death come. So I don't know how to successful. But the real death come, I don't know. <laughs> suppose I'm preparing for that. <laughs> So through that way, through that practice, actually, you see, control, not death itself, but you see, uh, the process of dissolution. You see, because you, see, you familiarize several years, even you see, when your mind is still fresh, uh, young body, so these familiar, uh, then old age. Uh, your, and particularly at the time of death, your mind automatically, those gross level of mind, because your body becomes weak, 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 weak. So the gross level of mind, also the sharpness of that mind, also is weaker. But the lifelong sort of training of familiarize these things, then uh, that particular sort of subject, at the moment, you can keep sharp mind, right? So, uh, you, the death process, more mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. uh, To recognize the processes uh, when they occur. Uh, the dissolution, eight stages, like that. So that, uh, that brings possibility at the final lowest or deepest consciousness or mind occur then the Tamba Simtuyaji. So to be able to retain the awareness at that moment, when even at the, the final moment of death. So in any way, it is better, you see, to think that is part of our life. So now that will come. Then the important is, you know, uh, while we are alive, our, our, li our life should be meaningful, should be sensible. That means, <laughs> if possible, Help other, serve other. If not, restrain, harming other. Then the last moment come. You feel regret, no regret. I carry my life meaningful way. Otherwise, at that time, I think a lot of us the regret, right? Regret. Oh, like that. And then also attachment. Just I met some my my close friend. You see who. The, who feel some, some who feel some problems, and I told, I told, her, I told him, oh, we we should practice, practice of detachment, detachment, non-attachment, non non-attachment, the detached only. Yeah. <laughs> now, firstly, <laughs> our attachment <laughs> biased. So we have to build the kasutu, uh, unbiased love or compassion, or perhaps, I think, attachment. So in order to develop unbiased, infinite love, first, we should reduce our attachment towards our own circle. That also is a very, very important practice factor. factor like that. So in, I think, the secular sense, this also is, it can be useful, useful. like that. Sometimes, you know, the attachments to the Sajmish physical 
sometimes in the secular context, when we speak of attachment, we take it very seriously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So then more attachment, then finally they come yeah. more difficult. I mean, putting together what we've been, the different things we've been talking about, it may be we can conclude that some of the sources of distress that people might feel at their own death have as much to do with the feeling of distress that maybe they didn't live a meaningful life. They didn't live a full life as it does with the prospect uh, that now they're in, uh, of the death themselves, that maybe there's a connection between a meaningful life, a fulfilled life, and the uh, efforts to understand how, what it means, how, how one can die with less distress uh, at the end. Um, does anyone, what, can we? You, you raise a very interesting point that has to do with palliative care, and you, you mentioned earlier the weakening of the body and to some extent the weakening of the mind. The parts of the brain that tend to go first are the parts that help us learn new information, hippocampus, uh, and it, the parts that we have learned a long time ago, the things we've learned a long time ago, s tend to persist. So I think you raise a very interesting point that if people practice dealing with death earlier when they're more vigorous and healthy, they're more likely to be able to use that experience even at the end of life. So if I could just add that uh, in, in aging research, one of the really prominent theories that tries to explain why it is that older people um, come to be, to experience more life satisfaction and prioritize social and emotionally meaningful goals is because they recognize that their time in life is limited. This is work by Laura Karstensen at, at Stanford University. And so many of her studies have shown that it's this change in mindset that people have that's somewhat like what you're describing in terms of appreciating one's own mortality um, that really shifts people's focus to things that, that are more meaningful to them. And then the question is, can you move that earlier in people's lives and get that appreciation, uh, make that vivid for people earlier so that they don't sort of wake up one day and say, oh, you know, my life is now short and I have time to catch up. I, I, what we found with older people is that they, they tend to live more in the now. I, I live today because I don't know what next week and next month's going to bring. And that may be bring with it more attachment to other people because the, the attachments become more meaningful when you know your time is limited. So mm -hmm. I think those, those are interesting theories and uh, fit in with this whole thing of, of, of kind of meaningfulness at the end of life. That wasn't a question, but. One of, I mean, we, there's a lot of research on end of life that's really struggling to figure out how to put into place right. kinds of practices that honor people's needs for quietude and um, social connectedness and so on. That, and, and there's a lot, the practice doesn't necessarily support that in modern medicine. See, see much of what we're talking about, some people would call wisdom. Do you think this relates to having acquired some wisdom by an older age that gives insights to these things? <laughs> wisdom is a very difficult term, it and we don't know how, where uh, we would put it. Uh, but uh, but I, I usually feel or telling these people, uh, human intelligence is something very remarkable. Now, intelligence, you see, can show us or can tell us even within the emotion, what kind of emotion is beneficial, right? Constructive. Uh, or constructive. What emotion is harmful, even for our health and relations with our community, with our family members? So all this intelligence, responsibility, and also sometimes you see uh, the emotion, the destructive emotion also upper hand, right, okay. and control intelligence. Then disasters happen. Uh, so more balance, 
and ma mainly, I think, intelligence. The, it is the responsibility of the intelligence, is it, to Kasota? To evaluate. Uh, uh, to val uh, evaluate. Uh, uh, emotion. That, as we call wisdom, oh, I don't know. Sometimes wisdom means one of the problems with the term wisdom is that sometimes when you use the word, people tend to think it has connotations with some kind of religious ideas, mm -hmm. religious concepts. You know, I think there's a profound lesson in your meditation on death. When you think about Dr. Holland's comment at the beginning that she couldn't even use the word cancer, medicine does not do what you do. Medicine in general encourages people not to meditate upon death to avoid it, not to face it. And yet our experience is that it strengthens people to be able to share their fears of death, to change the meaning in their life, to grieve losses when it happens. And I think that is one area where your tradition and what we do in medicine really could fruitfully meet because in most other parts of life, we tell people to plan and prepare for them, learn how to drive a car, learn how to do things. When it comes to death, we don't. And I think that would be a very important lesson for modern medicine. Take a Nicaragua and this also. Those hypnotized chairs that you did on in Nazan Yondu search. Take another, you are the same when you look at the case and a top of Tommy or Chiva. One she taught it. You look at it. Take a Nicaragua and the to make taught to me Yondu said the you look on a pageant matter. His Holiness, uh, uh, so he's returning back to the same point um, that we discussed about the actual reduction of the physical pain. <laughs> and um, so as a result of hypnosis, so His Holiness is wondering, because often in the discussions with scientists, um, His Holiness said that he brings up the kind of the, the classical Indian, you know, kind of um, philosophy of mind's distinction between sensory processes on the one hand and processes that are more cognitive and mental on the other, such as thoughts and so on. So, um, so the pain reduction that you're talking about, would that be more in the distress mental domain or you're talking about actual sensory level of experience? Well, I think in a way that's another kind of dichotomy that needs to be broken down because in fact, our brain sensory experience is part raw input and part expectation. It's part what we know. So you, you look at me and you see a man because your brain knows what a man would ordinarily look like. You don't build up that image right away. So all of our true sensory experience is a combination of perception and brain expectation. And in a sense, that means that the brain can literally change the sensory input. And we have evidence from recordings in the brain that if you hypnotize someone and give them a shock on the wrist, within a tenth of a second, the amplitude of the brain's response to that shock is reduced. So, in fact, I think the brain changes the sensory experience. It's not simply changing the reaction to the sensory experience. Then I have one request. <laughs> Some pain here. <laughs> <laughs> now, now how, how to reduce through practice of hypnotize? <laughs> I, I would be honored to hypnotize. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I will not be a very faithful disciple. <laughs> Very skeptical. <laughs> I have ways to overcome that. <laughs> Maybe this is a good moment to now invite uh, the audience who's been patiently waiting to get involved to put some questions. And you're free to put questions to whoever is sitting up here that you'd like. Um, but the only request is to please make them brief and to please make them questions. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, where, where is the? I, I actually can't. I did, uh, where Where is the microphone? Yeah, so if you come down here. There's one, there's one right there. Yeah. 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 Go on. Off you go. Uh, let me just get a, a 
Well, we'll do, we'll do it. At a, we'll do. As, we'll take as many as we can, and we're going to go a little bit past 11:30 because we started late. So we'll take the full time. Your Holiness, I have a question for you about attachment. Um, you speak often about the importance of of not having so many attachments. It's a, such a, a fundamental part of Buddhist practice. But the research of members of the panel is talking about. Um, being integrated into your community, being in, in, in the Western mind, we think about it, that as being more attached. So it's like the, the science that we've seen this morning is talking, at least as a Westerner, I would think it means to be more attached to your family, more attached to your friends. But that goes against so much of the fundamental teachings of Buddhism. So I was wondering if you could mm. give me your reflections on, on mm. how to think about attachment. Thank you, It's earlier now, I think obviously, uh, some kind of attachment, uh, even animals also have that experience. So these are biological, not through training. Now, those people who have interest uh, about sort of the universal sort of love, right? Real compassion. Uh, universal sort of compassion. That also is the same sort of Kasuda Kasurbena. One aspect of attachment is very closeness feeling, a sense of concern of their well-being. So that part uh, I said, uh, should increase, uh, not your own small Indeed. circle, but then the infinite sense of being. Uh, so the normal attachment, biological factor, that's mainly oriented about others attitude. So therefore, those people, or even animal, nice to you, you develop attachment. But as soon as their attitude towards you change, no longer attachment. No longer love, no longer sort of compassion. So that kind of compassion is hindrance of infinite love. So therefore, the uh, closeness feeling oriented about others' attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, then here, very much sort of, uh, directly, very much linked with selfish. Uh, they were nice to me. So I love you. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> your enemy, very bad to me. So instead of love, hatred, anger. Uh, now forget you see their attitude, but they also see same human being, same sentient being. Uh, they also love if our affection. So on that basis, not their attitude, regardless what their attitude, but as a sort of the person, the person being, no. or sentient being, and then uh, sort of extend uh, love. extend our love, sense of concern of their well-being. That can go towards your enemy. Enemy, the attitude is concerned, negative to you. But still, they also sentient being. They also want a happy life. So, on that basis, we extend our love. That love is uh, not biological factor, but biological factor, love, take as a seed. Then use our intelligence, uh, pros and cons, right? Oh, then through that way, uh, take consider long term, because of the uh, benefit is more important than immediate, because of the limited or city, benefits, no? uh, benefits. So like that, you see, the more training, use our intelligence, long term sort of interest. Uh, it's not only just Buddhist practice, but I think common sense. Uh, I think so, uh, think more about others' well-being, regardless their attitude towards you. I think human nature also, you see, have some sort of the ability show our affection to strangers. Right. If the stranger is passing through some difficulties, one time, it's a one. I think the Second World War pictorial sort of was the magazine. Uh, magazine. Uh, magazine. You see, show. One, I think, a Greek soldier or something. In any way, it's one soldier. 
their enemy soldier, you see, they failing, falling. Yeah. The other soldier, they can. Mm. Uh, as a sort of one level, they cause the, the, the enemy. So have to kill. But on level of human sort of human being, uh, right. human instinctive sort of. Instinctive uh, human uh, human feeling. You see that person shot, no feet, no falling. falling down. So that disregard. What is that category? Take care. So that's also you see part of our kasuda. nature. Our nature. Animal, perhaps. His Holiness is wondering whether this. Although we, we do see a kind of similar form of altruism in animals within their own species, but he's or wondering. species on their own group. Groups. Uh, but he's wondering. But beyond whether, that, I don't think. I don't think. We may, we may not want to. We don't have an expert in animal behavior expert up here, but, uh, <laughs> but it's a, probably there are people who could talk about it. But I, I'm going to, if it's all right, uh, allow a couple oh, yes, more yes, people yes. to ask a question. Would you like to ask a question? Uh, well, well, good, as many, as I, many hands as I see I can. If you could, uh, microphone is coming. Thank you. Um, so many questions, difficult to ask just one. <laughs> well, you only get one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I was hoping that His Holiness and Dr. Nielsen could um, ex expand on the notions of self-control. Uh, self-control is... Closer. Sorry. Uh, Dr. Nielsen, and, and you refer to self-control as a key part of, of what you're observing. And, um, and of course, self-control is, is a key part of what uh, the Buddhist practices are about, but in, I think, a, a, perhaps a different way. So I'd like to hear more of your thoughts on that. I could start with the secular uh, perspective of, of self-control. From a, from a health perspective and a developmental so perspective, there's a, kind of a growing sense that something like our ability to regulate our behavior um, it's been called uh, the personality trait of conscientiousness, the ability to follow rules, the ability to follow through on things and be planful, uh, the ability to regulate your emotions. In economics, people talk about as the ability to put off uh, impulsive behaviors and wait for the future, that all of these kinds of traits have something in common that's this regulation, sort of a top-down controlling of some impulses that we have that may play out in a whole host of areas in our lives. And, and many behavioral interventions are trying to figure out you know, how to intervene there and to promote that. Um, and I think that the, the challenge is, is to figure out how to do that. What doesn't seem to work is to, to tell people they need to, right? <laughs> um, because they recognize that already. Um, but what may seem to work is to, to motivate people through other routes to do things that would be good for them anyway, but nonetheless still drawing upon these basic faculties that, that uh, enable us to take more management and, and own our own behaviors. Oh, that's, that's entirely that's right. So actually, the very meaning of self-discipline is self-protection. Uh, of course, there's some sort of religious uh, the rule. Rules then you sometimes is it for long-term aim. Uh, uh, this is a sort of discipline uh, that come, uh, not because of basis on our daily life or, or okay. this life. Mm. That's something different. Otherwise, this is self-discipline. That also, I think, a long-term best interest for you, for individual. This is certain sort of things should come to rest Restraint. Like that. So that also the social the protection of oneself, like that. So that uh, I think even animal, I think to some extent, uh, I think one food there, but you see we already planned some sort of Secret to catch, then they're very cautious. <laughs> the, the one side, they sort of there was the desire to 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 eat using that food, but at the same time, little sort of cautious. Mm -hmm. So some form of self-discipline. Self-control. 
Oh. So we, our intelligence is much more sort of like deeper, deeper or wiser. So long term uh, consequences, consequences I mean, negative consequences, and then self discipline. So self discipline is protection, self protection. So the we, should, we should not Kasoda, misunderstand. Discipline is something because of religious uh, way, idea. A religious idea. idea. No. But and free, free society means So one should not uh, misunderstand the meaning of discipline, uh, thinking that in a free society you don't need any discipline or control. <laughs> uh, since you already as you ask about the uh, interspecies among animals, there are well documented evidence of mother elephants taking out a small rhinoceros that was found in the mud of a lioness in South Africa who took care of orphans' antelopes, baby antelopes, and in Calcutta Zoo of a tigress who fed little pigs that were <laughs> orphans. So there are multiple examples also of dolphins saving people who were in difficulty in the sea, protecting them from sharks, attacks even. So there are actually multiple examples of empathy going beyond species. Oh. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. And about the thing which you mentioned about applying, putting the grandmothers uh, in Nepal, we have a project where elderly widows are taking care of orphan street children, and huh? they are so happy together. Yes. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I'm going to get this. Sorry, was there somebody? Yeah, let's. Go. I'm going to try to just. Sort of, we'll, we'll try to come back to you, but just so we're not sort of focusing on too much on one. Yes, uh, the woman in with the white jacket. Thank you. Um, <coughs> this is a question to Your Holiness, also to Liz, and I'd also appreciate any other comments on this. Um, and it, it's related to um, Liz's um, statement that we need a mind shift uh, because of the poor social environment we have for our aging members. And um, so my question is, is really this, how do we create a mind shift in our culture? And as a result, one example would be to create more richer uh, environments for our elders so that they can be actively and meaningfully engaged in life. Thank you. You know, the Robert Butler, who was the first uh, director of the National Institute on Aging, said that the biggest problem, or one of the biggest problems, is that we're all in denial of our own aging. And, um, but really, we're facing a huge problem if we don't start embracing that reality. And we should start thinking about what kind of society we want to inhabit when we age ourselves. And I think internalizing that reality of what aging means may help people to maybe catalyze energy towards, towards changing social institutions. I mean, there are many, many groups working to improve existing institutions or develop new kinds of interventions. Um, but for those things to gain traction, I think a cultural mindset shift that doesn't sort of promote a lot of anti-aging formulas all the time, but thinks that aging is something that um, is natural and will happen to every one of us. We'll all be young and we'll all hopefully be old and, and we should embrace that, I think, and maybe that will help. There's an issue around stigma mm -hmm. that implicit. You talked, I think, at some point in your talk about, uh, about stigma and this has come up that is there, is there something about also overcoming stigma toward, you know, that, that we have towards aging? Well, I think that people have misconceptions that most I mean, people may have misconceptions that, that you know, aged, our old years are times of infirmity and that most people are living in nursing homes, and many will be, and that's also something we have to grapple with, but most people will be in the community. Most people will not have dementia or serious disability. I mean, we're seeing improvements in medicine have actually been responsible for many of those kinds of delays. So if we have an attitude of age, about aging and what it's like to be old that's really at odds with the reality, we also need to know more about, about the facts. 
another question. Yes, and then the woman who's sitting patiently on the steps, but we're gonna take this gentleman next. Um, where is the microphone? Could it, the, uh, if you could just stand up so they, we, they know that, there you go. Uh, first of all, that, that was a wonderful panel, and thank you guys so much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Spiegel, this question is for you, it's a brain question. Uh, so, uh, you mentioned the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is being involved in, in this hypnosis business, and, and that makes sense. Uh, it, in terms of deployment of attention, cognitive control, that, that's a good story. The, the, the problem, uh, the, or the question is, uh, it seems like there's this component of suggestibility that you talked about, right? Where people could be persuaded that things are true whether they're true or not, uh, and, and they could be made to feel true. And that seems distinctly different from something like uh, oh, uh, focused attention meditation, right? Because here, the rational faculties are actually enhanced. Um, and, and so we can deliberate on things in ways that are, are very, very clear for long periods of time. So I guess the question to you is, how do you, do you think there's a way to distinguish between them? Uh, and is there an interesting story there? And what do you think that story is? Thank you. It, it, it's obvious that I didn't hypnotize you, because you're, <laughs> you're not being suggestible at all. Um, but I, it, it's a good question and an important one. What, what we showed in, in this study, which involved hypnotizability, not being hypnotized per se, is coactivation of the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex with the dorsal anterior cingulate. Now, the anterior cingulate does something different. It isn't thinking through a problem. It's thinking, what is a problem? Or what do I need to pay attention to and what can I forget about? And I think where it happens in hypnosis is that you narrow the, the range of attention. So you stop thinking, who is this person who told me to do this? And what does he know? And why should I do this? Will I feel silly if I do? Will it help me or not? So it's not that you couldn't think about it. It's that you narrow the domain of things you think about. You're less likely to contrast and compare and more likely to engage yourself in the content. It's like being so caught up in a good movie that you forget you're in a theater, you enter the imagined world. So it's not a loss of critical judgment. It's a reduction in the domain in which you would exercise it. To take, hey, Jeff, we're, we're going to take one more question for His Holiness, and then he has to go. Uh, so, I, but there will be another opportunity in the afternoon. I apologize. I know there's just not enough time, but we'll be, there'll be another af opportunity in the afternoon for asking questions. So, Jeff will, I guess, take the last question. Where is the? Um, Jeff, right? Yeah, there's, where's the mic? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, it seemed that a common feature across the different activities and interventions that were described by Drs. Nielsen, Spiegel, and Holland um, were, whether it's in sustaining healthy aging or interventions to mitigate the distress of disease, was um, the encouragement of positive emotions. And so if that would be the kind of the core substrate, I guess the question is, is, is how can those be sort of developed or how can activities or how can... Um, uh, behaviors be, be taught that encourage p positive emotions, and I'd be interested to, as to whether His Holiness believes that that is really a central element in terms of being facilitative of healthy living as well as adapting to disease. So that's the key factor. Uh, I think not only in modern time. But last, I think, three, four thousand years. This is the, uh, I think, mainly religious sort of the group. Always talk about the uh, importance of compassion uh, and the sense of what's the brotherhood, sisterhood. But, of course, millions of people, I think, got immense benefit, but world not changed. <laughs> so, in modern time, I think some small, small organization here and there making sort of effort, I think, would much effect. The only thing is through education, global sort of education system. Uh, uh, I'm not talking about religious matter, religious topic. Simply 
Now these, you see the Hazara, how to build a healthy society, happy hum humanity. Uh, so now, uh, that I usually call secular ethics. So secular ethics, uh, very, Hazara, no, no difficulties uh, to, introduce, no. to, to introduce in secular education field. System. So actually, uh, so some people actually is working how to introduce in uh, education field uh, some education about importance of warm-heartedness uh, uh, with a lot of explanation and mainly now like you see your so the scientific findings. Finding, no. I think possible. So that's the only way. I think education, because uh, of the universal. Universal. Uh, uh, if we, because of the based on religious belief, then no matter one, also one one religious tradition is something very marvelous, but will never be universal. Uh, so we need the secular way to educate people uh, <coughs> uh, the sense of concern of others' well-being. Uh, another word, compassionate sort of attitude, is your own the best interest, interest, most effective sort of interest. interest no. So we can teach them through scientific sort of findings. And as uh, Canola mentioned, the instinctively the seed is there. So then further sort of the information uh, and give more material, use our intelligence, then that brings conviction, that transforms our behavior. And one individual sort of behavior, uh, one in, uh, I mean, there's a change through education, then because of that, 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, 100,000, million, billion, go like that. So that's the only way. We have to find ways and means to introduce in modern education system. That must be strictly uh, secular. Uh, secular approach. No? Secular approach. I think that's very, very, very possible, very possible. So I think, uh, with the help of these scientists, you are finding, uh, uh, then uh, if we make attempt, as uh, the first, firstly, the also experiment, experiment plan. Right. Say some school uh, carried that sort of uh, curriculum. Curriculum. curriculum no. uh, we'll okay. see. After five years or six years, if some definite sort of impact, positive impact on, on their mind, then can extend 100 school. And like America, I think st then eventually the state level, you see, can introduce that. Then federal level, then like United Nations, and then all other sort of member, all member of the United Nations, so we need this convincing sort of city. Uh, uh, material. Uh, material. And uh, I think we can do. And although our organization, Minded Life, a young organization, right? Right. now within the last over two years, right. you see, a small sort of institution now seems to see grow quite well. <laughs> so, so now, uh, is it sort of is sort of start in America, now go to Europe, and then different countries in Asia, like that. I think we also you see, can make some significant sort of contribution. Now we, I think, uh, I think, maybe up to now we have done the research in Tanzania. Up to now we have been focusing more on basic research. Uh, now maybe time come 
on the basis of our finding through research. Now, how to introduce, uh, how to implement to actual sort of the effective way to humanity? I think possible. So like yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs>